The world is the desert of sin, and in it we dwell, and in it life is cheap. All human life, from conception on, is made in the image of God and therefore has intrinsic value. That is, it is naturally of value because it is the image and likeness of God, and it is human life. But we will be born into a world of sin, where sin prevails and where we too are sinners and will do sinful things. Our peak value is when we are infants. In the world's scale of things, we are actually in our peak value, or should be considered so, because a child might grow up to do anything, be anything, rescue anyone, cure anything. The potential is endless and unknown, but we human beings, as soon as we are of age to, we learn how to devalue ourselves. We devalue ourselves with our behavior, our conduct, our sin. We cheapen ourselves all the way up into, until and including murder, rape, and destruction. Things for which people end up executed because, well, their personal value of their life in the world goes negative. Once you have gone berserk and murdered a dozen people and ended up in prison, it makes no rational sense to the world to keep you alive. There's nothing you're going to produce in prison that could possibly offset the cost of sustaining your existence and you can't be set free. How quickly we go from infinite potential to negative value depending on the course that we take through the world. We cheapen everything around us when we live a life cheapened by sin. And yet somehow, it is in those moments that we hold it of value. The world is the desert of sin. We live in the dry deserts and the hot rocks, thirsting and longing after something. And we will fill that longing with things around us that we find in the crags and crevices of the desert and the rocks and the heat of hell poking through. But it will not sustain us. It will not fulfill us. It will not give us true life. The laborers in the vineyard are a perfect example. They have come up against God's economy versus human economy or the economy of the world. Economy is actually a theological term for those that don't know. Who gets what and how? Oikonomia, how God's stuff is delivered to people in the here and now. The economy of God is different from the economy of the world. And that is what the parable that we have before us is really about. The guy who's committed a dozen murders and is awaiting the electric chair might repent might convert, they might believe, and they get executed and they go straightway to heaven. And there's something deep in the guts of the human race that says that's wrong somehow. That's why people invent fantasies such as purgatory where you have to work it off because we want some sense of earthly justice to all of this. How does the murderer on death row, the one who has believed for only a short time when Lord I was confirmed under Pastor Rook and had to stand with my head against the wall. I had to put in work for your name. I have worked through the heat of the day and I have labored through it all. And this guy that got to be a wretched, unbelieving sinner doesn't have to believe and doesn't have to do anything until the last split second. Lord, if he gets a denarius, how much more should I get. Because inversely, we have taken the one who cheapened his life in this world by his behavior, and we want to cheapen him spiritually. We want to rob him of his intrinsic value as one made in the image of God. And of course, the world, this is one of the many things that gets upside down and backwards, where it's okay to murder babies, but not to execute criminals when the word of the Lord gives us the opposite. We might do things in this world that cause our expulsion from it by force, and God allows us 
that as a community in the world to have to make those choices. But nobody, nobody gets to take away the intrinsic value of the human being who is made in God's image. That remains the same. That is the same in time as it is in eternity. It is the same everywhere in the view of God and his face towards us when he looks at us, when he loves us, the way that he beholds us as his children, equally his children, despite our failure, no matter how horrible our offenses. And really, the prodigal son syndrome, as it's usually called after that parable, the idea that it's wrong somehow, that the guy who converts at the last minute suddenly goes to heaven, and I was forced to actually memorize my catechism, probably in German, if anyone out there remembers that. Now that's rigid discipline. When we complain about that, we're not actually begrudging the Lord God his generosity, are we? We're not really begrudging him his mercy. What we're actually saying is a life of sin is better, aren't we? We're saying how lucky that guy was that he got to live a life of an unbelieving wretch his whole life, and now he still goes to heaven. He never had to memorize his catechism. He never had to go to church. What we're really doing is looking to the Lord and devaluing the gift he gave us because we did earn more. We all get the denarius at the end, but we were gifted something. You were gifted growing up in the community of faith and all the blessings that come with it. You were gifted not knowing the wretchedness of waking up in a den of sin with the drugs leaving your body and taking another dose to go on with your fornications and your puking and your filth. You were gifted a life free from that. The guy that got the short end of the deal, if we're going to measure it in that sense, is the guy that converted at the last minute that had to live an entire life in this wretched world without faith as a guide, without God as a guide, without the comfort and bosom of his church. That's what they really get wrong in the parable. It isn't begrudging God's generosity. It's the assumption, presumption sinfully, that it was better to spend less time in the Lord's vineyard. It was better to do less work for the Lord. It was a superior thing to not bear the heat of the day with God there to shield you with the cloud, to guide you by the fire, to give you water from the rock, miraculous bread from heaven, and send you quail when you complain too much. The word of the Lord is true. We all have intrinsic value. The denarius is the same for all who convert, all who repent, and all who believe. But the blessings or the torment of life in this wilderness will vary depending on where and when and how we are sheltered under the Lord's wing. We begrudge him not his generosity when we have a bad attitude about it. We begrudge him life in him and in his church as though it were bad. But nevertheless, God has mercy on everyone, doesn't he? At the end of the day, everyone who has been gathered into his vineyard receives that which was promised, to which he rightly, of course, says, you got what you agreed to. I told you that heaven and the new creation was what was coming, and it was coming for all who believe. That was the promise given when we were baptized, and many of us don't even remember our baptism because we were infants, but God is pouring this eternal kingdom on us even then. It is no different than the ones that receive it at the last minute. The circumstances in this world vary, but all receive the kingdom to eternal life. He gave us everything he's ever promised. We are not lost, or he's not failed to give us anything. We have been given everything that was agreed to, everything we were told up front, and everyone who believes in him receives it. It's the beauty of his cross. And this is why the dying, bleeding Jesus on the cross says, it is finished. It is not his life that is finished. It is the work of atonement. It is not his life that is finished. It is ours, that it is completed, made whole, and made new. That it can come full circle 
from the sin we committed in the garden to the redemption that flows from his riven side to us in the bread and wine made his body and blood. It is delivered to us for eternal life, complete, fulfilled. No matter when we were called, where we were called from, or what our circumstances, the end is the same. Because that's God's economy. That no one can receive more than perfection. So receive perfection. In Jesus' name, amen.